Commissioner Cox, why are you considered, you and your, and your colleague, uh, Commissioner Yelstein, why are you considered the only good guys on the FCC? What happened to the FCC? Well, I don't know if we're considered the only good guys, but we're the two that have been certainly uh, most out front in behalf of media democracy and trying to get some public interest obligations restored to our uh, broadcasters. There's been kind of a regnant philosophy in Washington in recent years, as you know, that the uh, best role of government is to, quote, deregulate, end quote, and let the magic in the marketplace solve all problems. And I think both Commissioner Adelstein and uh, me are of the opinion that there are some problems that uh, do not get solved that way. And certainly with regard to this very precious and very special industry, uh, which is our media, uh, that the people own the airwaves, it's a very different kind of industry. And in return for using those airwaves for free and to make a good living, broadcasters undertook to serve the public interest. Over the course of the last 20 or 25 years, most of the public interest obligations that once we had uh, have been frittered away uh, for one reason or another, which we can go into in more detail, but very little remains. And now is the time, I am convinced, for us to revisit that issue. I think the American people are in a mood to take on this issue because they know something is fundamentally wrong with uh, the media that they are being asked to uh, accept and asked to endure. Let's talk specifically about um, strategies and tactics for 2007. If you had uh, um, say to, to name the top three items on your uh, agenda or what you think the public should be most sort of focused on or concerned <clears throat> about in terms of FCC and, and media issues in, in the coming year, what would that sort of top three list be? Well, there are lots of issues that come before the FCC that are important to the American people, like broadband and, uh, and uh, many others, telecommunications policy generally. Since I got there five and a half years ago, my top three are media reform, media reform, and media reform, because I think it's that important. I think the country is being disserved by uh, the excessive consolidation that we observe in many areas. I think it is inhibiting the democratic small d dialogue that a people need to have in order to have a functioning democracy. I think we are losing local news. We are losing coverage as all the studies show of political campaigns. Stations are not teeing up issues of interest to the locality. They don't even go out anymore and, and talk to uh, local people about what it is that should be uh, uh, should be carried on the, on the broadcast. So we're I'm a believer in small d democracy. I think most of us are. If you give people a sufficient breadth and depth of information, by and large, you'll make decisions that are generally good for the country. But I think we are skating perilously close in significant measure because of media consolidation to denying them that kind of information they need. And you know, the Supreme Court was on record in the Red Lion case in saying it's a duty under the First Amendment to have a uh, a clash of antagonistic opinions and to tee up issues, and we're not doing that now. We're getting all of this homogenized, canned national news, uh, infomercials, and, and things like that instead of that kind of dialogue. So that's, that's uh, unfortunate. And then if you look at the kind of entertainment our people are getting, uh, that's homogenized, it's uh, playlist, it's lack of local genius, lack of coverage of local artists. We've been in so many communities. Uh, just in Nashville a couple of weeks ago, we had the uh, country music capital of the world. Famous people testified, people like George Jones, Porter Wagner, and others, Naomi Judd, uh, citing the difficulty of getting their records played on radio. That's one reason why radio is in such a desperate uh, condition in the country. I don't know why they don't recognize it, but you know, my kids get in the car and they, they won't listen to the radio anymore. They say, why should I listen to the radio? They don't play the kind of music I want to hear, and I have to listen to all those uh, commercials. So they're really important issues here, and they go to our very uh, essence as a people. Media is precious. It's how we communicate with one another above our personal sphere. So it's a very special industry, and everybody that's a part of it, especially the broadcasters who get to use that, uh, uh, those airwaves, have to be uh, stewards in the public interest. The law requires that. We've drifted away from that. We don't hold them to that anymore, and we've got to get back to it. Someone that Free Press is going to be paying very close attention to in the com coming year is Kevin Martin. 
What is, what is your opinion of, of Kevin Martin and, and his contribution to the FCC? Well, he's our, uh, he's our new chairman. Well, I guess he's been chairman for almost two years ago now. We came uh, at uh, pretty much the same time, almost exactly the same time to the FCC. Uh, Kevin and I have a good uh, personal relationship. I like him uh, a lot. I find him to be uh, uh, open to uh, discussion. I find him to, uh, when, he, when he gives a commitment, he will carry out his commitment. We have a different approach. He uh, uh, is more, and, and you, you ought to speak to him, but uh, you, know, you know, it's, it's more, I think, of the uh, mindset that uh, we shouldn't be very proactive, that uh, a lot of these problems don't merit or, or command the attention of the, uh, of the commission. So I'm trying to push to get a lot of these public interest questions that have been on the shelf at the FCC teed up and he and I uh, disagree on that. We have other disagreements too with regard to important questions like network neutrality, the future of the internet, uh, how proactive should we be in getting broadband out to all of our people and closing the digital gap which I think still exists in this country and the digital gap between the United States and the rest of the world when it comes to broadband. We're number 15 in the world in broadband penetration. Uh, and the uh, ITU, the International Telecommunications Union, actually came out with a, a new study last fall, a somewhat more nuanced study called the Digital Opportunity Index, which went into broadband penetration and wireless and computers and price and all. You know where we were on that list? Number 21, right behind Estonia and tied with Slovenia. So I'm saying to my colleagues at the FCC, we're supposed to be doing something about this. The telecommunications law says we should be doing what we can to help get uh, advanced telecommunication services uh, deployed to all of our people on a reasonable and timely uh, basis so that rural America and the inner city have access to comparable services to everybody else. I think we have to take proactive steps to make sure that happens. I think there are areas in this country where the magic of the marketplace has not gotten that kind of broadband. That's why municipalities are going ahead and doing these things. There's lessons to be learned from what other countries are doing. So I'd be more uh, proactive. So, uh, uh, so the, the differences at the commission are not personal uh, differences. Uh, they're not usually partisan uh, differences, but there are some basic philosophical and fundamental differences over, uh, over how we should proceed. My sense is that the country is changing. My sense is we're entering into a more progressive, uh, reform-minded uh, era right now. So the message I've had out here in Memphis to the Media Reform Conference has been we don't need to be just playing defense anymore. We don't have to just be focusing on preventing bad new rules. We ought to be going back and revisit the bad old rules that got us into this mess in the first place, and we ought to be taking proactive steps to reinvigorate broadcasting with some public interest responsibilities like we used to have. Um, when, you were, uh, when you were a little kid, did you dream of being an FCC commissioner when you grew up? No, but you know, I always wanted to go to Washington. Very uh, interesting. And I started writing letters to uh, U.S. Senators back when I was a kid in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, when I was 12 or 13 years old. It was kind of a strange preoccupation, I guess, for, for a little kid, but, uh, but I was always interested in that. Uh, I became a historian eventually, got a degree in history, and I was out teaching at uh, Loyola University in the South, and uh, my interest, uh, I had kind of broadcast my interest in sometimes spending a couple of years in Washington, D.C. to get this public service politics kind of uh, drive out of my system, and I got a job with uh, Senator Fritz Hollings from South Carolina, so I was just getting engaged at the time when I told my wife to be, we'll just go to Washington for a couple of years, I'll get this all out of my system, and then we'll return to the uh, groves of academe. And that was in 1970, and I'm still there, so the public service uh, uh, bug bit, and, uh, and I've enjoyed it. I spent a few years out in the private uh, sector, eight or nine years of that, but then came back during the Clinton administration. and got into a job that involved uh, a lot of different business sectors, including telecom and IT, and then when the Clinton administration left, some of my friends on the Hill uh, was, uh, suggested I might uh, be a fit for the FCC, so I uh, ended up down there. It's a wonderful place to be because these are the edge of the envelope questions. This is where the, all the action is going to be, and uh, in my mind, when you come right down to it, the telecommunications industry that accounts for about a sixth of our economy, I think it's the most powerful and the most influential 
industry in the United States is going to have so much to do with how we progress in the 21st century, how competitive our country is going to be, how fulfilled our kids are going to be, and it's really, uh, you know, it's, it's a kind of a mind-blowing experience to be involved in all of those uh, issues. So I'm, I'm uh, inspired by that. I like it. I'd like it better if I was in the majority at the FCC, probably, but, uh, but I like it still. What were those letters about when you were a little kid? What kind of, what kind of stuff were you... Uh, oh, kind of a lot of it was just, I like your picture and your, and your uh, autograph and, uh, and things like that, and just kind of building up a file, but I was curious that those were my celebrities, rather, although I, I like the Cowboys, too, and Hopalong Cassidy and Roy Rogers and all those folks, too. When you think about your own uh, personal experience with, with media, are there moments that kind of stand out for you where you're watching television or you're listening to a radio or, and, you, and you had kind of a profound personal moment? I'm kind of an, uh, a news uh, junkie and a documentary uh, junkie, and I, I, I watch a lot of that. So, you know, whenever the history-making event comes, I'm tuned into that. I'm kind of a C-SPAN junkie uh, in watching the uh, proceedings of the Senate and the House, uh, although there are times when I, when I stop and think about it, and I wonder if that has really been... Uh, advantageous to our democratic dialogue or not, because when I went to the Senate back in 1970, we didn't have television, and I love that it's available to me, and I still want to watch, watch it all, but it's not the kind of debates we used to have back before, uh, before we got television there. A lot of times these guys are down there, and they might be seeing very intelligent things, but their colleagues aren't listening, and the whole purpose, well, one of the purposes of Senate debates, obviously, is to inform the people, too, but it's to inform your colleagues about your expertise in a particular issue or a particular matter, and if they're, if they're not listening, that's bad, and I think there's maybe a little tendency to sometimes to play to the camera, and we need to... We need to take that into consideration. On balance, I'm, you know, I wouldn't take it away because I love to watch it. Let's talk a little bit more about specifics for 2007. So what three things can the media reform movement to do to right. help you in your work right. in, the, in the year ahead? Number one, do no further harm. So we have to have some grassroots pressure and some grassroots action to make sure that we don't come with some bad new rules. One of those would be, I think, doing away with the, or greatly loosening the newspaper broadcast cross-ownership ban. I don't see how it serves localism, democracy, or the interests of our people if we're going to encourage in a multitude of markets, and Michael Powell would have extended this to 160 or 170 of our 210 markets where a newspaper and the uh, TV station could, uh, could join forces. When that happens in a community, I don't care if it's a big community or a little community, it confers tremendous influence on that, that uh, joint venture or that combination and that doesn't serve the public interest, so we got to make sure that doesn't happen. Then number two, I think we should tee up all of those public interest uh, proceedings that have been on hold since 1999 on disclosure of what a, pro what a station is doing to serve the public uh, interest, and there are several others. We had a presidential commission back in 1999 that said we're going into this age of digital television. Here's how this uh, ability to multicast can be made to serve the American people. You have all these opportunities now. Shouldn't, shouldn't some of that inert to the benefit of the American people with more diversity in the programming and all? Uh, so I'd like to see us call that up. Number three, I think we need to get a real, honest-to-God renewal process and a license process at the FCC. It used to be that every three years a broadcaster would have to come in after he got his original license and demonstrate that he was fulfilling a list of 12 or 14 specific public interest obligations. It's all been changed now. Uh, legislation changed it and, uh, and we have, uh, uh, have made it even, even looser than uh, the legislation envisioned. Now once every eight years you send in a postcard to the FCC and it's a slam dunk just about that you're going to get your license renewed on the basis of that postcard application unless there's some character accusation out there against you if you're a wife beater or a child abuser or something like that. We might take your license away. We're not going to take it away on the basis of you're not fulfilling your public interest responsibilities. Why? Because there are no more public interest responsibilities. All of that stuff is gone. The, the requirement that a broadcaster go out and talk to members of the community about what kind of programming they would like, what issues teed up, 
We don't require that anymore. Now, isn't that curious? Because in the old days, when the station owner was a local guy who went to the barber shop, who went to the bakery, who went to the church, who saw the people at the, at the restaurant, we still said, you've got to go out and convene some discussions on what you want. Now the owner's in some penthouse office uh, thousands of miles away. We don't have a requirement that he go out there and find out. So just send in all your homogenized, nationalized PAP and... Uh, uh, and we'll say you're doing fine and send in a postcard once every eight years and we'll see you. So we got to do something about that. That doesn't, serve the, uh, that doesn't serve the public interest. Every one of those stations should have to come in much more frequently than once every eight years. I'd like to get it back to three or at least five. And the commission should have to positively opine that that station is serving the public interest. We don't have to be micro-regulatory about it. We don't have to be burdensome about it. But we sure as heck can do better than we're doing right now and just saying, here's your license, no questions. And we don't even look at the public file as a matter of course. We require stations to keep a public file. As a matter of course, we don't look at that public file when we renew a license. Mind-blowing. People understand that. I think there's support across America to reform that license process. And I think if we could do that uh, this year and next year, that would send a wonderful signal that would get us directed down the road of restoring public interest to the broadcast industry. And I think we'd make some real progress in returning the airwaves to the people and something called media democracy. My last question for you. 30 years ago, nobody really talked about the media environment the way that we do now. Do you, and, and, and now it's kind of exploded onto sort of the public radar and is part of public consciousness. Do you think that we're undergoing in the midst of a similar transformation in terms of how people think about media issues? Are media issues the environment of the, the 21st century in some ways? I think they're really important, and I think they are on people's radar screens. And I think when you go out, you know, I think Michael Powell sat in his office three years ago and thought, who cares about this stuff? Who cares about the overlap of grade B contours and radio signals? Or who cares about precisely how many outlets one company can own? But when you go out and tell the American people, hey, there's this little agency on the shores of the Potomac that's doing something pretty much behind closed doors, not, not doing any great national hearings or anything like that, and doing something fundamental to change the ownership of the media, your airwaves, I've seen this everywhere. People get downright proprietary and downright mad in one big hell of a hurry. And that's why three million people contacted the FCC to protest with Michael Powell was doing. When I went there in 2001, I didn't know three million Americans knew there was a place called the Federal Communications Commission. But there's three million people that know now. I think there's a lot more than that. And I think there are new issues out there now, like the future of the internet and internet freedom that are bringing all of those millions of people into this uh, argument or issue against media consolidation. So I think we are entering a period of reform. And uh, you talk about an environmental issue. This is a capital E environmental issue because the media is our environment for communicating with one another above our just personal discourse like we're having here. Everything else is through the media. That's, that's our environment and we got to make that a uh, pro-consumer, pro-citizen uh, democratic environment.